Behind me rise the stunning Patagonian peaks of Fitzroy and Saratori, famous amongst climbers and photographers for their steep walls and inclement weather. Join me as I traverse rivers, climb glaciers, and cross an ice cap to get a different view of these often photographed peaks. I'm Art Wolf. This is Travels to the Edge. A couple of years ago, I was flying from Punta Arenas up to Santiago, and I looked out the plane window, and I saw these great spires. Big glacier on the west side, and I thought, that would be a fantastic place to go and shoot. Patagonia encompasses the great tale of South America. Straddling both Chile and Argentina, it stretches across the Patagonian ice caps over the granite masses of Fitzroy and Torres del Paine to Tierra del Fuego, the southern extreme of the Americas. This region is defined by the incessant winds, vast lakes, incredible wildlife, and tall granite spires. Mount Fitzroy and Saratori are world-class mountains that have been photographed largely from the same viewpoint. The reason I've come to Patagonia is really to get three distinct views of these very famous mountains. I love the idea of coming around these great iconic mountains and photographing them with a different view. Hiking through the trees, these twisted trees, is a great counter to what lies beyond. In this forest, you've got lichens and mosses and tiny flowers. This is a beautiful forest. I like the way the light comes down through these trees. Joining me on this journey is lifelong friend Rick Holt and local guide Walter Rosini. So many people see it from this side. So this is our challenge, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. To gain these views from the north, possibly from the west if we're really lucky. If the weather permits, it's a wonderful so, trek. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's an expedition. It's not just a trek. As we hike up this valley, we're starting to lose the vegetation and suddenly you're in a really open landscape of short heather and meadows. You see the moraine and the residue of ancient glaciers. It's really this big U-shaped valley of rock and open skies. You're so embedded in this valley, you still don't have the views of the mountains you've come to see. This is a great place, guys, to see what a moraine looks like. This is a frontal moraine where we are right now. It's a deposit of material down by the glacier. I'll show you with an example here with my boot. Imagine that my boot is the ice coming downhill. It advances, and because of an increasing of uh, global temperature, the ice betrays, but it leaves a deposit of material. That those are the moraines, the frontal moraines, we've got in this case, lateral moraines of the size. Yeah, this is the beginning of a lot of loose rock. This journey is really challenging because you're spending most of the time just bouldering, walking over scree slopes of really loose rock. Looks like we got a crossing. Looks pretty cool to me. It's like cross first with my okay. backpack, so I change boots, then I turn back and help you to crossing, okay? Yeah. 
I hate walking around with wet boots. So I've absconded a pair of porter boots. And unfortunately, they look like a seven and I'm a nine and a half. But you know what? We're gonna try to make it work. I feel like Cinderella, as I say. One of the things that I noticed the most about Patagonia is the air is so clear. The skies are dramatic. There's really a deep, deep, clear blue punctuated with these beautiful swirling clouds. Hey Art, do you think the weather's gonna hold? Well, this being Patagonia, I don't know. Wow, look at the North Face. That's amazing. Right after we establish camp tonight, I want to come back and shoot that mountain before it disappears. But weather, can't predict it here. We just hope it holds up. Yeah. When you're on the track, you're always watching the weather because when it's clear, you're always nervous because it's going to change. And when it's cloudy, you're always hoping that it's going to clear. It never stays the same. You know, Rick, this is one of the views that I really wanted to get on this trip. This is the very impressive north face of Mount Fitzroy, and the weather is perfect for this. This is the one shot I wanted to get on the north side, and look how beautiful Fitzroy is blowing out there. to be committed to go all the way around these mountains because you're really at the mercy of the elements. Probably seven out of 10 treks fail. Well guys, the Marconi Glacier. It's time to harness up, get on the crampons and hit the ice. It looks like it's gonna be windy up there. There's a lot of shots to get on top of the glacier, but even more seductive is to get in and under the glacier. There's 200 feet of ice pressing down on this rock. I'm looking for abstracts of color and texture. I love to challenge perceptions, and this is a great environment for doing that. Wow, it's amazing. If you look up into this ice, you can see all the pockets of air trapped in there. There's a beautiful contrast between the pink of the outside light and the blue of this interior space. Ah, 
this is nice. As I look through this ice, I can see a lot of the outside light that's reflecting down into these recesses, and it's really fantastic. Oh, I love this. Everywhere I move the camera becomes a new abstract. As I document this expedition, I'm going to try to balance the grand landscapes with intimate landscapes and unusual things that I've not photographed before, and this is one of them. I've photographed countless streams flowing out of mountains, but I've never photographed a stream flowing over the top of a glacier. And what attracted me to this shot is the beautiful blue that's the backdrop to the rapids. To convey that in an artistic way, I've taken a long exposure, so it's going to have motion blur, blue coming through, and I think it will be a very, very nice addition to the collection of photos I amass on this trip. Wow, the weather is so nice right now. Hoping for the second shot I want. Seems pretty safe. These crevasses are really wide open, so you can see them coming, and that's the big danger of hiking on a glacier is not seeing the crevasses. We're absolutely going to make it Marconi Pass today. What I'm hoping is that those clouds dancing over the top of Fitzroy remain in place towards the late, late afternoon light. I think that could be spectacular. We've seen three or four good avalanches come off this wall. They say that the a snowflake that falls from the sky and hits these glaciers takes 300 years before it's released from the glacier. I find that utterly amazing. On the glacier, it was one of our hardest days, and yet it wasn't that hard at all. It's not even cold, but the clouds are moving in, and that gives me a little bit of uh, pause for concern. Art said he's not too tired. I am. This is it. The end of the day. The end of the day, end of the glacier for today. Mm. Voila. We are on Marconi Pass, and this place is famous for the winds, and although it's really nice right now, the lenticular cloud building up over the mountains, I think, is an indicator that winds are on the way. This is my second favorite view that I was hoping to get, and it's the northeast view on Mount Fitzroy and Saratori. As you can see by the light on the mountains behind me, it's pretty flat. There's a very thin veil of clouds obscuring the sun. But as I look to the west, there's a big gap in these clouds, and I suspect in an hour or so, things can really drastically change.
Regardless of the atmospheric conditions, I'm always shooting because you never know whether a tiny break in the clouds will suddenly reveal a mountain or close in, and that's the last shot of the entire trip. So I'm always shooting, expecting those shots to be the last, but invariably, it gets better and better and better. Working in Southern Patagonia, you're, you're basically in what they call the Roaring Forties, the lower latitudes where winds come racing across the Southern Pacific some 2,000 miles unimpeded by any land formations. And they literally slam into these jagged peaks that rise thousands of feet out of this very narrow isthmus of land. It was bound to happen that the weather would catch up with us, and now it has. The weather is pretty wicked. We've got a fairly long trek uh, to our destination. It's probably about a five hour hike. Today is a very long slog on a very big glacier. the moon day, everything changes. We're walking on, on the ice cap, so it's a huge terrain. All right, look at the horizon right now. You can't even see the difference between the snow and the sky. This is the closest environment that I can remember to Antarctic. It's just so flat and limitless. It's amazing to me to walk out here in this great expanse. It's almost impossible to judge distances. I know that we're going to be heading another three hours down to camp, but I, I look ahead and I can't even fathom how far that is in terms of the mountains. It's kind of a great feeling to be out here in such a wide open space and the only people you see are the people you know. Our main objectives, the views of Fitzroy and Saratori are cloaked in heavy mist. In this part of the world, if the weather clears, it's an amazing sight to see these mountains come out of all the mist. And if it doesn't happen, okay, this is not the end of the world. Unlike art, I don't get to do this too often. We'd be pretty disappointed if we don't get a good view. Based on what I see and my experience in the mountains, I don't think we're going to see the mountains for at least a day. And we're appropriating enough time to give it at least three days. And after three days, if it doesn't clear, we're moving on. It's amazing how the weather of Patagonia always is taunting and teasing you. They give you little glimpses of these great mountains through these clouds. And sometimes those views open up to a grand vista. More times than not, they close back in. We finally have arrived at a spot that we think is perfect for Saratori and Fitzroy. Based on what I see on the horizon, I think we're going to need all the three days that we've allotted here. This is a very exposed place, so we're gonna create a wall out of blocks of ice. You arrive at a place where you think the mountains will be stunning if the weather clears. You build your wall of ice, you erect your tents, and you hope the following day the weather will, in fact, clear.
I'm absolutely ecstatic. This is a view that I've been waiting years to see and years to photograph. It's unbelievable how miserable the weather was yesterday and how clear and perfect it is today. Just to see Fitzroy and Saratori rising right out of this vast glacier, it is perfect. What I'm concentrating on is just doing the rock in the ice, the ice on top of Saratori. And with a polarizer, I'm darkening the blue sky, so there's a beautiful contrast. Clouds really lend an element that makes these mountains that much more intriguing to my eye. The west view of Mount Fitzroy and Saratori is everything that I had hoped it would be. These mountains just rise out of this ice cap unabated in these vertical walls of granite. I can't think of any landscapes on Earth that match the dramatic vertical rise of these great mountains. It takes a lot of work to get here. It absolutely takes a lot of work. And then you have to have luck, perseverance, and uh, it pays off eventually. This is fantastic with the light, the way it's playing off these rock faces, the glacier on the bottom, the blue sky behind it. It gives a nice, really dramatic effect with the light. You know, what I love about this composition is just the cleanness of the granite, the blue sky, so, so perfect. I like the way the ice just rims each one of those pinnacles. I love the way these things just jut up in the sky. They're so uncompromising. So few climbers have ever stood on the top of that mountain. When you think of Everest, who's been climbed hundreds and hundreds of times, you know, this mountain has had a handful of people on the summit of it. It's extraordinary. And that's just indicative of how wild Patagonia is, how inaccessible it can be, and how harsh the weather can be at times. There's an allure, there's a, a draw, there's a magic about mountains. It's really comforting for people to realize that there's places on this planet that are untamed and raw and wild. My photographs are intended to remind people that places like Mount Fitzroy and Saratory exist. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge. The American Southwest is like no other place on Earth. Epic in its history, both natural and human, it has been sculpted in intriguing ways over the millennia. It's a landscape that invites the explorer to see how the Earth creates art with the simplest of elements. I'm Art Wolf. Join me on Travels to the Edge. take a lifetime to explore the American Southwest, but it would be a lifetime well spent. The Southwest covers a large geographic area spanning several states. We'll be focusing on two of them, Arizona and Utah. While this unique region was shaped by the forces of nature, it has also been touched by the hand of man. Because of the distances, we'll be road tripping a bit, starting in Arizona and then heading into Utah. Canyon de Chez is one of the most significant formations of the Southwest. The Navajo Nation revere this place for its history. I'm fortunate that my guide here in Canyon de Chez is James Yazi, a Navajo man that grew up in this canyon. Canyon de Chez is spectacular, not only for the beautiful cliffs all the way up through the deepest recesses, but also for the groves of golden cottonwood that grow along the river. 
is so open, you can see everywhere, and the pace of the horses really allows you to bring in the beauty to really appreciate the land. In addition to the natural beauty of this canyon, there's these very significant panels of rock art. Okay, nice. When you first come across a panel, what are you feeling? Are you feeling the same kind of excitement that I feel when I come across this? Or? Uh, oh yeah, these are really, that I mentioned, they're a really spiritual place to me. So it gives me the chill sometimes. Why do you think that the early people made these? These are probably made for, mainly from my point, they're probably a representation of ceremonies. So what would you speculate from the very first people that would put some figurines on this wall to the last? How, how long of a time are we spanning here? Probably a little over four to 5,000 oh. years people has been occupying the canyon. They had such distinct styles from the Anasazi to the Navajo to the Puebloan peoples. Each had a very unique way of recording the human form. There's very, very little destruction. Yeah, there's hardly anybody visits these sites. And even us native here, we kind of like stay away. Spiritually, these are really unique sites. That's why we don't touch these. I mean, it's really hard to describe in words. <laughs> Anasazi both painted and then carved into the rock. Yeah, pictograph or paintings and then petroglyph are carved, etched into the canyon wall. And the walls here like sandstone, it's very soft canyon sandstone. So that would be typically yeah. not in an alcove, not an possibly alcove, right yeah. out there on a the wall. Usually petroglyphs are on the open main canyon walls. This is quite a panel. This is a lot of petroglyphs. Tell me a little bit about this wall. It's amazing. And this site here, we call it the newspaper wall. I can't really understand why they call it newspaper rock. I mean, it just unfolds. Human figures, animal figures, bird figure, astronomy figure, plant figure, a lot of different designs. And these are the, the petroglyphs. Wall. Petroglyphs, they're all carved into the main canyon wall right above the little ledge here. And this is largely Anasazi. Anasazi and also a lot of Navajo rock art. And it's a record of the people that lived here. This is great, great light. It's so oblique to the rock that they stand out so beautifully. There's almost a three-dimensional quality to the way the light is falling across these petroglyphs. You know, it almost gives it volume. This is one of Kenyon Deshaies' classic locations. It's a Anasazi ruin known as House Beneath the Rock. It's amazing how they've built these very, very large structures, high on a wall, protected from potential enemies, really tucked away under this great overhang. It's such a classic, really beautiful location. The context of the environment, the beautiful texture of the wall, and also the shadows make it a really intriguing image for me.
this is the perfect conditions to photograph this subject. I'm in the shadows of these great walls and everything now is bathed in even very soft light. It's not about depth, it's not about stunning rock art, it's all about color and it's right here. I'm heading northwest to where Arizona borders Utah to see a rarely visited location. Steve Dotson, a local guide, is taking me to his favorite spot in Vermilion Cliffs National Monument. We're going to go up on the Vermilion Cliffs, which is called the Priya Plateau. Priya Plateau is a three-sided plateau with thousand-foot cliffs around each side. It was declared in 98 as the Vermilion Cliffs National Monument. I've always been around it. I've never gone up on the plateau. Well, you're in for a treat, that's for sure. I've never seen anything quite like this. How did you ever find this? Well, I do guiding up here, you know. Yeah? And uh, actually, no, not too many locals know about this place. It's a pretty unique spot. I love the way the texture and the red and the yellow uh, intrusions kind of mix into this really abstract patterns. What we have here is the Entrada sandstone. Entrada sandstone, huh? Uh -huh. I'm really liking this shot. What I tried to do in a lot of landscapes I work is use a wide angle lens. And with a wide angle lens, it slightly distorts the reality, but it makes drama. And what's happening here is these really strong vertical lines sweep down the slope and off into the distant landscape and it creates a really strong sense of depth and that's exactly what I'm trying to do in this particular shot. waited to the last winning moments of light to reveal this really unique sandstone structure. As the light goes down, it, all the highlights are really brought out. This is the valley of these white mushrooms, or hoodoos as they call them. It is so spectacular. This tallest one must be at least 60 feet tall. I can't believe it. And these are really just narrow columns of rock that form as a result of a more resistant cap rock that protects all the softer material underneath. And through the millennium of weathering and rain, it just erodes everything below this tougher rock on the top and creates these columns. This is spectacular and we caught it just in the great light because the whole background is in deep shadow and this hoodoo rises and catches the light. Side lit is extremely dramatic. Great, it moves so fast, it makes photographers like myself pretty darn neurotic. I position myself so that in just a few seconds, my face and the camera will fall into shadow. But as the sun goes over the cap rock of this giant 
hoodoo. I'm gonna click a shot just at that moment so that it actually looks like a starburst. And it's just about to happen. Now it's happening. Voila. Just across the border in Utah is the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, an area that's great to hike and explore. One of the most interesting features of the American Southwest are the narrow chasms in this Navajo sandstone known as slot canyons. And one of the most engaging twisted and narrow of these slot canyons is one known as Spooky Gulch. The deeper you get into this canyon, the higher the walls become. And basically, as floods have occurred over the millennia, they keep cutting deeper into this really soft Navajo sandstone. It's really what makes this place special. I found a great location to work in this very narrow cut gorge. Basically, I found a, a fairly wide chamber that allows the light to filter all the way down into the deepest recesses of this chasm. The thing that I like most about it is the way the light reflects on these walls. It gives every little angle uh, a, a texture. It gives it a, a slightly different reflective quality and that gives it a complexity. starts. Oh boy. Oh, I think I am getting to the end of my rope. At the end of my canyon. I think it's time to explore another canyon. One that's a little wider. Definitely gotta lose weight. On the next canyon. Less than 24 hours ago, this riverbed was flooding. And as the water receded, it revealed a very slick texture. What I'm seeing in this just very small area are some really nice curves. The way the mud is reflecting the sky gives it a very sensuous texture. I could spend the entire afternoon working in this shadowed little ravine and be as happy as a clam. such an aberration in the desert. This huge body of intricate waterways, open skies, rounded buttes just rising out of the water. I'm exploring the backwaters of Lake Powell with guide Kyle Walker. 
love this area. Around every one of these bends, there's a little treasure to discover. Yep, each turn brings a whole new set to discover. And you know, the nice thing is there's 96 of these canyons. 96, 96 canyons. canyons. So there's a lot to see, a lifetime to see. It's quite a sensation to kayak through these really narrow canyons flooded by the waters of Lake Powell. As you go around the bend, new vistas open up and the walls just reach right down into the water. It would be impossible to reach some of these canyons without the waters of Lake Powell. There's no place like it in the world. There's no question. You yeah. can't get out of your car and look at what we're looking at. Yeah. You have to come out and spend some time and, and want to be where you are. the magic hour and all the oranges and blues of this unique place are at their most beautiful. Utah's Zion National Park has soaring rock formations and unique gorges cut by the rivers and streams running through it. I'm hiking to see one of the most unusual of these with Ranger Tom Harridan. This is the subway, huh? This is the subway, often talked about but seldom seen. What made it so symmetrical? Well, it's a softer layer of rock and uh, it just erodes away, leaving this arched shape. As you get farther and deeper into the subway formation, these deep emerald green pools start to dot the landscape and the walls literally arch over the top of you. One of my favorite subjects to photograph are the really simple forms of trees. And I can't think of any trees that exemplify this more than the aspen. When most people think of the Southwest, of course they think of the open buttes and the desert landscapes, but there's a lot more in the Southwest. There's these mountains that rise out of the desert. They become truly alpine environments with vast groves of beautiful aspen trees. Photographers have been drawn to aspen trees over the years from Ansel Adams to Edward Weston to many of my modern colleagues. And I think it's the textures, the beauty of these trees. They're great, great subjects. I have found a really nice grove of trees here. There's such a uniformity of the trunks all lined up. There's no distracting elements. The light is perfect. It's a huge light box with these heavy clouds. The fog has rolled in. It makes everything so much more uh, like a painting. Not only are the trunks of these aspens so beautifully white, but the fog gives it a little bit of distance, a little depth. I've been photographing the Southwest for over 30 years, and I'll probably keep coming back until I can't press the shutter any longer. The region's combination of grand landscapes, bizarre rock formations, and intricate details will always keep me exploring.
I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge. Varanasi is the spiritual center of the earth for Hindus. Millions of pilgrims and sadhus come from all over India to purify themselves here in the sacred waters of the Ganges. Upstream in nearby Allahabad will join 20 million Hindus for one of the largest religious gatherings on earth, a great bathing ritual known as the Kumela. Standing here in the Ganges, I'm Art Wolf. Join me on Travels to the Edge. Northern India is dominated by the Himalayas. Snow melt from the high peaks flows into some of the most sacred rivers in Asia. We'll be traveling along the Ganges to India's holiest river cities, ancient Varanasi and the place where the Yamuna River meets the Ganges, Allahabad. The Ganges, known as the Ganga by Indians, is a mandatory stop for Hindu pilgrims. I'm here on the most important day of the Kumela Bathing Festival. My guide, Balbir Singh, is prepping me for what's up ahead. Kumela is basically it's a festival where the sadhus actually come together from all over India for the holy uh, rituals, which actually takes place in the, next to the Ganga. And they take a holy dip in the, in the river. So a bathing. It's, it's a bathing, bathing in the purifying waters of the Ganges. Yes. The sadhus are the holy men. Sadhus are the holy men from India. They're trying to reach uh, uh, the so-called light of achievement of uh, the supreme power. They actually have given up, set it, set it away everything. They well. renounce everything, everything that they own. Yeah. Many people have said this is the largest gathering of humans in one spot in the history of the world. It is. And this is all based on the stars, right? It's all based on the stars. The alignment of the planets, planets tell and, you yeah. when and where. Precisely. Where we're heading off just now is it's called the Sangam. Sangam is the congregation of the two rivers, Yamuna and the Ganga. And that's it's supposed to be the most sacred place where the two rivers meet. And this is where all the sadhus, all the holy people, and all the pilgrims converge. Yes, precisely. Not thousands, but millions. millions. That is sheer mass humanity. And these people have come from all over India, am I right? All over India. This is sheer chaos. We're trying to get in a position where we have a clear view of the sadhus that will come down to take their bath. And yet, we're looking at the hind end of hundreds of people that have gathered for the same thing. So we're going to try to negotiate through the sea of boats and pilgrims and get a shot. Are we going to be able to get over there, do you think? We're trying to. It's just very shallow. Let's just walk. This is an amazing press of humanity. This is great. There's just all this pageantry, people holding banners, marigold in their hair. It's a scene. It's beautiful, actually. Sadhus coming in with paintings on their foreheads. These sadhus are having a great time, splashing water at each other, posing, strutting around like a bunch of peacocks.
lands on Earth that looks like this. It is very much a celebration and a moment of happiness for the Sadhus as well as the greater masses that have come so far to participate in this ritualistic bathing of the Ganges. Even in the earliest moments of the day, the air is filled with a hazy blend of dust, smoke, and humanity. I love working in the margins of the day, especially in the morning when people are just waking up. It looks just like a painting, which is always what I'm trying to do, is to marry these two mediums of painting and photography. And when I get it really close, magic happens. This is Sadhu Central, and each one of these tents, there's a head Sadhu and his followers, and there's a real hierarchy amongst these Sadhus. Oh, yes. They all look like fascinating people to me. Look at these guys. So go, unique. You could always go and have a cup of tea with them. Yeah, I yeah. would love that. It's a great honor to be able to sit down in a sadhu's tent and share tea with them. These are very proud people, and they're very much revered throughout India for their stature, their willingness to sacrifice and live a very simple life. And it translates on these faces. I want to show them what I'm getting now. So, it, it's always incredible to me how everybody, no matter what culture, what faith, what point they are in their life, everybody enjoys photos of themselves. It's one of those memories that I'll take with me the rest of my life, to think that I was in here interacting with these holy men of the Hindu faith. Hello. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? It's nice seeing you again. Okay. Gentle people. A sadhu on a motorbike. It's so creative, all these lights. It's beautiful. There's a fire. It's just right at twilight. It's a beautiful blend of oranges and orange flame and soft muted tones. Downstream from Allahabad lies another of India's holy river cities, ancient Varanasi. 
It's a place where pilgrims come to bathe in the Ganges and cleanse their karma. Each morning at dawn, gifts of light are offered to the gods in a ritual that has been performed for thousands of years. You wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you thank the Lord and you look at the sun and you thank them for giving you another day. It's like almost saying good morning to sunrise and in the evening it's good night to the sun god, giving offering to the sun god and the river. You're giving us the cycle. And that's in fact what's happening when they take a chalice or a container and fill it full of river water and then return it to the river. Yes, it's an offering. What I've noticed here as well is there's a rhythm to the day. You know, we're out here early in the morning and getting the sunrise and it's very quiet and then people start arriving and then the activity level starts to pick up and then during the course of the day it builds and then in the evening it starts to quiet down. People are coming in doing peaceful offerings, putting candles on the river. So the river and the entire society has a rhythm. You can see the entire cycle of life by looking at the river. There are people coming in, people dying, people enjoying themselves, just life. Well, this is like a true example of an ancient civilization on the riverside, whether it's the Nile or whether it's the River Ganga. And this particular place is one of the oldest uh, places in, in, in India. It's about 3,000 years old. And most of the building which was here, which you see, is, was built by the kings. And they made these fortresses so that they could live out here and die out here next to the Ganga. Varanasi is the place where people come for the last rite. They prefer dying out here because being sacred. To be able to, your last rite to be done at the river Ganga, it's like almost like going back to your mother. And she is the mother of all. This is so rich, this waterfront with all these bathers coming down, you've got these boats in the foreground and people taking care of their boats. There's so much subject matter that just kind of blends into one big tapestry. And that's what I'm really trying to capture is that timeless ancient India and where better to capture it than here along the Ganges in front of Varanasi, this ancient city, this holiest of the cities. I just love the fact that all these gulls are just obliterating these boats full of pilgrims and you just see bits and pieces through them. So it becomes a really abstract and beautiful shot. Just one of many that I keep finding along this riverfront. It's just extraordinary. The Ganges epitomizes life and here, everywhere you look, you see life. This is really nice. These people are getting water in their urns and returning it to the river, offering water to the sun gods. It's a very beautiful and ritualistic moment. It's just really quite nice and lovely just to see them really seemingly unaffected by our presence.
Right now I'm isolating this woman wearing this beautiful green dress with the fabric laying on the steps behind. It's just such a simple but elegant image of daily life here along the Ganges. I think I really respond to is just this pattern that these men get into. And there's a rhythm. It's the rhythm of the river, I guess I'd say. Everywhere you look around, there's a great photograph, it's a great moment. And that's what this society is about, you know, connecting with the river and the gods and paying homage and bathing in the river. The river really is the source of life here. At dusk, it's a tradition to set candle boats afloat on the dark waters of the Ganges, a gift of light to the goddess. I'm trying to get a shot with these candles, but more importantly, the reflection of the candles on this young lady's face set against these boats on the Ganges. It's just a beautiful scene. She's got beautiful eyes, and we're just trying to get this while the light is still there. Each night, holy men perform the evening prayers. They chant as one and give offerings to the river, thus ensuring the sun will rise again in the morning. Sometimes the most beautiful moments are the most unexpected ones. We've come across this young man doing yoga on the banks of the Ganges, and this beautiful red orb is rising right above him. So I'm just trying to align the sun and his position in a very elegant way. This is a wonderful place, and often I just get lost in the movement, the sounds, and everything. What I'm photographing right now is symmetry. I love the design of the sadhu's face and the wisdom you catch in his eyes, but also the colorful designs that sadhus often have on their faces. The beard and the lines of the beard are really quite nice, and I'm just gonna accentuate that by moving in and taking a very, very stylized, very formal portrait so that ultimately when you look at the photo, you feel the same moment that I feel when I'm taking the picture, and I accomplish that by just simply having the sadhu staring straight into my lens and therefore straight into your eyes as you look at this image. I 
I'm often looking for these small vignettes that really establish a sense of place. And this says it in a very beautiful way. It's obviously very old. The color is worn, but that worn pastel palette really works well with the subject. And in very early morning light, it just complements the scene. In India, the cow is a great symbol. They're very sacred and they're very friendly and they're wandering everywhere and they're almost like dogs. They're just like everybody's pet. They have a good life. So yeah, this one's taken a liking to me. I think I'll take them home to Seattle. Yeah. Got a really nice shot of this sadhu with his trident. The trident is a symbol of Shiva, one of the Hindu gods, and these sadhus typically will walk around with these tridents. And it's just such a classic shape with the marigold wreath around it. I'm just lining the trident up with this sadhu's face. It's just beautiful. Great shot here of these two musicians right along the banks of the Ganges. The sun is set, and as the light level drops, there's going to be a beautiful balance between the reflection of the fire on the faces of these two musicians and the orange glow in the sky beyond. What I'm trying to do is illuminate them with the fire, but also balance it with the sky so that it becomes a really beautiful silhouette, but warm glow on their faces. India is a great place. There are so many things that are uniquely different than where I come from. The sights, the smells, the sounds, the people, the traditions, the rituals. For me, everything is culture shock. And that's exactly why I love coming here. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge. South Georgia Island is bitterly cold, wild, inhospitable. And yet, it has one of the largest concentrations of wildlife found anywhere. is my favorite place on Earth. I'm Art Wolf. Join me on Travels to the Edge. The southernmost tip of South America is Cape Horn. Antarctica lies 800 miles to the south. The remote island of South Georgia lies to the east of these two continents, exposed to the full fury of the Southern Ocean. Joining me on this journey is one of the world's foremost authorities on seabirds, Peter Harrison, and explorer and naturalist, Shirley Metz. This is the wildest island I can think of. There are only a few hundred people in the world that have ever circumnavigated this island because it's a, it's a fearful place. Take us around this coastline. This is as wild as it gets in South Georgia. We will feel as though we are in Antarctica, true and proper. Tell me about this area. It was here that Shackleton came in after his 800 mile journey. To this day, is still gasping at the open boat journey of 800 miles. What do you think is in store for us? Maybe two and a half to three days of rolling around in the windiest, stormiest ocean on the world.
run into a first class storm with 30 foot seas. Albatrosses are being tossed around. Very, very dramatic, but I am getting some great shots. If ever a place said primordial, it has to be South Georgia, especially in this pre-dawn light. The sounds, the smells, the sights of all these penguins and elephant seals. This is the place that I love to come back to year in, year out. It's really early in the morning and the light hasn't quite gotten up to where I can really start to do my work. So I like to walk around with my subjects and figure out a place to photograph them. Let's go down to the beach, get some photos. We'll have a little lunch. A lot of penguins here. Biggest colony in the world of king penguins. A few years ago, we only had, say, 200,000 king penguin pairs on South Georgia. Now, over 400,000 pairs of king penguins. Why do you think they're increasing at such a, an amazing rate? Well, I think the Earth is warming, and the warmer ocean around South Georgia, the pullback of all of these glaciers and so on, it has benefited the king penguin. I'm like a kid in a candy store. There's so much to work with. Committee of designers got together. I don't think they could have designed a more beautiful bird. Golden yellow stands out so regally against the silver. Silver and gold in a beautiful shape on the top of these birds. And it's just so fun to work with the color and the design of them. What I tried to do after having established a sense of place to these birds is find the details. It's those little moments that you capture on film that you bring away that really play nicely with the larger perspective. These are amazing, these elephant seals. They are so enormous, multi-tonned animals that come ashore to rest and to give birth to little seals. And these are actually mid-sized males right now. They're just incredible how high they can reach. They can stand up much taller than me and then they spar like this. They're sparring, they're interacting. There's little babies all over the place. They make absolutely gross sounds. They're amazing animals. When I 
go into a new environment, I like to shoot an establishing shot at a really wide angle. I love working with overcast light. Right now, I've got the best of both worlds. I've got overcast light, but blue sky behind. Very, very classic, calm morning, which is really an unusual event on South Georgia. Right now, everybody's calm, I'm calm, it's peaceful. This is the only island in the world where you can actually come and sit with wandering albatrosses. Peter, this is a big bird. Tell me about this bird. Well, it's not only big, Art, it is the biggest, the biggest flying bird in the world. There's nothing that is bigger. Males weigh about 24 to 25 pounds in weight. That's a Thanksgiving turkey size, but with wings wow. 11 to even 12 feet uh, from wing to 12 wing feet, tip. two yep. basketball players side by side. I guess that's right. I can fit under one wing there and they'd still have a few inches on me. Very long-lived birds. Long-lived, longer than I am. I'm 60 years old, that bird on the right could be 70 years old. 70, seven, seven zero. Seven zero. And not only that, these birds, when they fly, they fly five to 600 miles in a single day. When the youngster leaves this nest, goes out onto the ocean for the first time, spends the first seven years minimum at sea, by the time it gets back, it will have flown one and a half million miles. In its oh. lifetime, these birds are estimated to fly some 15 million miles. That's around 18 round trip journeys to the moon and back. Nothing flies oh. further than an albatross. Sadly, they are threatened. In the 20 odd years that I've been coming here, we've had numbers on South Georgia plummet from 4,000 birds now down to less than 1,800 birds. We've lost half in about 25 years. seals present a formidable challenge for photography here on the island because they're so aggressive. These southern fur seals were nearly hunted to extinction in the early 1900s. In fact, they thought they were extinct. And since the early 1900s, they've gone from maybe 30 animals to 2 million in such a short time. One of the most extraordinary comebacks of any animal species. And right now, these animals have come back with a vengeance. They're extraordinarily aggressive, very territorial. They bite. They will charge you from 100 feet away. I've had tripod legs sheared off and a force to be reckoned with. Surely it's amazing how this south coast of South Georgia is so much more glaciated and rugged looking. Oh, very much so. And this is where Shackleton ended up coming after his 800 mile journey. He arrived here in King Hacken Bay. He spends about four or five days here, gets resupplied, 
nails the uh, nails to the bottom of the soles of his feet, and then makes the journey up over the spine of South Georgia to the other side. 36 hours across the glaciers, over mountains that were never, ever traveled before, not mapped, not explored, uh, no food up in the mountains. So they had to take all of that with them. Incredible story. Yes, I, I, I don't think very much replicated at all still today. I mean, that's when men were men. An incredible journey and, and an amazing a rescue given the fact that nobody died on his entire trip. That was always something that Shackleton claimed that no man was ever lost under my command. This is a freshwater lake left over from a receding glacier. And in this lake are hundreds of young wieners, elephant seals that were born probably a month or so ago. And they've been fed on very, very rich milk from their mothers. And now the mothers have gone out to sea to replenish their nutrients. But for right now, these pups are jousting and playing and just hanging out in this very benign water. Great shot from about three feet away, wide angle. I've approached them from very low. They're curious animals. If you want to get unusual shots, you get into unusual positions. And by staying low, letting them look into my lens, they'll come right up and I get these distorted wide angles, which can often be fantastic. And I love these kind of perspectives because if you just stand up from five feet up, looking 30 feet away, it looks like you're looking at these animals. And now I want to kind of interpret their landscape, interpret their environment, and you do that by getting into their environment on their level. These guys are known as wieners simply because they've been weaned from their mothers. And when they see somebody like me laying on the beach, they may in fact think I'm mother. So they come in close. And I just love this interaction with these wild animals. And I'm careful not to touch them. Hey. Come on, you want it, you want it. Oh, there we go. Now, he's so curious. Oh, is he gonna touch my lens? Don't touch my lens. Oh. Yeah, if you blow snot on my lens. Ah, oh, that's what I said. Don't do that. Ah, oh, excuse me. Now look at it. That's you. Do you trust me? Do you think I look like your mother? That's it, baby. Your diamonds. More feeling. Oh, yeah. It's miserable outside, blowing rain, it's cold, and yet some of the best shots I've ever shot are in these very conditions. Right now I have a small group of macaroni penguins that have just emerged from the sea, and I've bundled up one of the few times not using a tripod because I'm just maneuvering the camera every couple of seconds. Now if a wave comes up and totally soaks me, it'll be well worth it because these are beautiful shots. Really, really nice. Even a reflection in a little pond. And there's a fur seal right behind them. So they've hopped right into me and they're coming right up to me. And goodbye. This is up close and personal because this fur seal has scared them. So they're not so concerned about me as much as the fur seal.
This is a very windy day here and I cannot find any penguins or seals on this really remote beach. But what I can find are some beautiful landscapes, but on a very intimate level. What I'm framing up here is just a close study of these beautiful lichens that thrive here in these very cold conditions on South Georgia Island. They're among the oldest, slowest growing plants on Earth. I love this. I mean, it's great for the mind. And when you're photographing wildlife, you're so caught up in following the action. But here, your mind can relax. You can really get into the moment. Well, you sure know a lot of history about this place. Well, I come maybe two or three times a year, and every time we always come to Griffithin, the site of the largest of our whaling stations, and there is, there is a lot of history here. Griffithin was the first of the whaling stations here at South Georgia, and it was started off in 1904. Now, what you have to imagine, Art, is that Cumberland Bay at that time was full of whales, and I mean full not like a whale here or there. I'm talking of hundreds and hundreds of whales. <sighs> they never left the bay. They caught hundreds and hundreds of whales. All they had to do was to row out, put the harpoon in the whale, and bring the scrot, that's what a dead whale is called, uh, back into the, the harbor. By the 50s, the whales were getting harder and harder to catch. These same boats that caught whales just in this bay, now they were going over 200 miles from this island to find whales. Wow. Actually ended around 1965, 1966. So about 55 years. 55 years. The combined whaling stations of South Georgia took 175,250 whales. They ranged from the biggest, the blue, to the rarest down in these waters, which was the southern right whale. Nothing escaped the harpoon here. Uh -huh. This is also the final resting place for a famous person. Shackleton finally came to rest here. He died in the bay here. His men erected a cross on the hill. He told his wife, my heart is always in the south. And if you go to the graveyard, you'll see that every single grave is buried with the head facing north to Europe. Sir Ernest Shackleton, the boss, is the only person with his head and his heart facing south wow. to the continent he loved called Antarctica. What a fitting place for him to be. I was walking down the beach and I just happened to see this great opportunity. There's a family of fur seals, several females, and an adult bull. Really nice moment with these otherwise very aggressive seals. There's three pups, two are the typical black, and one is this beautiful cream color. One in 2,000 occur with this color face right in front of us. What's nice about this is the seal pup's eyes are so black, it's a great contrast. The shots that I'm looking for are when the baby and the mother's heads come together and there's a little moment of nurturing and it just really plays well to the camera. Despite its isolation and extreme climate, South Georgia Island remains a remarkable oasis of wildlife. There's simply no other place like it in the world. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge.